And Dr. Uriji Chotubadhai is here to present a paper on pediatric neurology. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'd like to thank Vishwabandhan for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak on this important uh, aspect of uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, respected ladies and gentlemen and respected chairpersons. Um, what I was asked to speak on was, uh, as is given in the brackets, what are the probable causes of convulsions and how could they be safely examined in a non-progressive CP? What I thought I would do is just give you some ideas about managing epilepsy in children with cerebral palsy. And for this, I know we've gone through this uh, several times before this morning. Different speakers have been telling you, but I just wanted to, uh, to highlight certain aspects of cerebral palsy that uh, are important. First of all, the definition uh, that cerebral palsy is non-progressive. However, although it's non-progressive, that doesn't mean the child situation is going to not change. Of course, it will change because the motor impairments that are happening uh, in the child are sometimes changing, although the injury that has happened to the child is perhaps static. The incidence that has been given to you is uh, up to 2.5%, 2.8% in different studies, and that is also the data I have got. So cerebral palsy is a non-progressive disorder caused by a lesion or defect on the brain occurring maybe prior to birth, during birth, or during the first four years of life. So it's not always that you say cerebral palsy happens at birth. Even, for example, if a child who is two years old who's had a road traffic accident or meningitis, he can also be left with cerebral palsy. It is a permanent physical condition, so they are myths saying that it's curable. No, it's not. And it mainly affects movement, and it has a very uh, wide spectrum. So it can be as mild as just weakness of one part of the body, like a hand, or it can be so severe that it can be totally or almost complete lack of movement in the person. And what we need to differentiate cerebral palsy is with other neurodegenerative conditions, and these are the ones that actually progress. And we have many examples of those, and we, we, we find out about these conditions because of the progressive nature that can be ascertained by not only the history, investigations, but also by doing different tests. So what I want to talk about is excluding all these neurodegenerative or conditions that are actually progressive. So epidemiology, I've already spoke to you before. Um, the risk of cerebral palsy in a child who is born full term is approximately one in 2000. And the incidence has been correlated with the gestational age and birth weight. So it's more uh, higher incidence in premature birth as well as low birth weight babies. Now, of the known etiological factors, you can divide the etiology in three different stages. The prenatal causes, like uh, has been discussed, maternal infections, fetal exposure to drugs and alcohol, congenital malformations, uh, blood group incompatibility, and also prenatal chorioamniotis and maternal infections. In the perinatal group, we have anoxia, which is the important cause, fetal distress, prematurity, sepsis in the neonatal period, bronchopulmonary dysplasia that happens in premature children, and also uh, if a child is severely ill and then has to have some operative procedures. And like I was talking to you about before, postnatally also you can have cerebral palsy. For example, if you have a early childhood meningitis or hypoxia due to some other cause or trauma or head injuries, that child with a developing brain can also go and develop cerebral palsy. There are different types of cerebral palsy. I'm not going into the details, but uh, the types are depending on the type of movement disorder, the part of the body that is affected, and the degree of severity. And depending on the site of injury to the brain, you have different clinical uh, manifestations in the type of cerebral palsy. If you have, uh, for example, uh, basal ganglion manifestation, then the 
cerebral palsy is more likely to be dyskinetic. If you have a cerebral type of cerebral palsy, then ataxic cerebral palsy and so on. And what I want everybody to understand is that, of course, it affects the mobility and the balance, but there are a lot of other areas in the child that are affected, like the posture, the growth, communication and language and feeding as well, fine motor control, coordination, eating, drinking and swallowing, and also how to go about your activities of daily living, perceptual difficulties, and also cognitive difficulties like concentration and attention. Um, commonly associated problems with cerebral palsy are mental retardation if, or learning disabilities, which happens in more than 50%. Epilepsy, which is prevalent in about a third of all CP children. You have visual, hearing, and other defects in sensory uh, spheres that may be as high as 10% or more. You can have squint, you can have cognitive dysfunction, sensory problems, and also emotional and behavioral problems. And epilepsy is just one part of these problems. Um, so when we are dealing with a child with uh, cerebral palsy, you know, we do not just think about epilepsy. We have to think about the child as a whole. What are the other problems that the child is also facing apart from his epilepsy? So that is how I would approach a child who has come with me with epilepsy and has cerebral palsy. And evaluation for this child, like in any other child with cerebral palsy, if you have cerebral palsy and epilepsy, you have to start from the beginning in trying to obtain the birth history, trying to find out whether you can find out a cause about why this has happened, why the child has got cerebral palsy, and also trying to find out from the history about his preferences of which hand or leg he uses, and so on. And then the physical examination, which needs a detailed examination of not only the motor system, but also the sensory system and the reflexes, balance, etc. And we neurologists and developmental pediatricians and pediatricians also know or understand, we look for certain early markers that tend to give us a thought that this child can or maybe uh, develop cerebral palsy. For example, if you have a slow head growth, a poor head control, you have roving eye movements or poor hand regard. If you have a lack of auditory response, if you have irritability, seizures, poor feeding, poor quality of sleep, and extreme sensitivity to light, all of these factors are early markers of cerebral palsy. And also on your right hand side, as you can see, there are certain signs that we uh, look for, like a handedness before the age of two years, paucity of limb movements, toe walking, abnormal tone, or persistence of some primitive reflexes beyond the time that they should disappear. All of these give rise to the thought that this child may be developing cerebral palsy. And the associated disabilities that I've been telling on again is not only seizures, but you can have a child who's also drooling, may not be able to swallow his medicines uh, properly. So you have to think about what to administer him, what is the best pharmacological agent to administer, what is the type of preparation and so on. As regards the hypoxic ischemic brain injury that is often talked about, only about 20% of CP is attributed to intrapartium asphyxia, meaning when it is happening during the labor process. And about 70 to 80% of the known causes of cerebral palsy may be due to antenatal causes. Of course, all causes of cerebral palsy are not known. Up to 40% of all children who have cerebral palsy, we do not find a cause of why this has occurred in them. And the timing of this hypoxic ischemic brain injury is also important because if it happens before the 20th week, during the migration and defects uh, of the brain, then you can have different sort of uh, problems in the brain as a result of this migration uh, of the nerves that have been defective. And if it is between 27 to 30 weeks, you can have periventricular leukomalacia, and if it is more like a term baby after 34 to 40 weeks, then what you get is focal or bilateral parasagittal injuries. This is a study which shows uh, the incidence and type of epilepsy 
in 100 patients with cerebral palsy, and as you can see, the majority of them had the generalized type of epilepsy, followed by partial epilepsy, and also a certain percentage presented with infantile spasms. And uh, this was the types of uh, seizures and what epilepsy types these, present, these patients presented with. For example, most of the patients could present with generalized tonic-clonic seizures, but if a child, for example, presented with infantile spasms, then the most likely type of cerebral palsy that child would have would be the spastic tetraparesis. So some conclusions from this particular study uh, that was uh, done by Isaac et al. was that epilepsy in cerebral palsy can be predicted if seizures occur in the first year of life or in the neonatal period and if there is a family history of epilepsy. Another study that I'd like to talk about is relating to, again, cerebral palsy and epilepsy. And here what was found as the most common type of cerebral palsy that was associated with epilepsy was spastic tetraparesis. Here about 60% of patients in this particular study had epilepsy with spastic tetraparesis, followed by 46% in hemiparetic type of cerebral palsy and 44% in diplegic type of cerebral palsy. Now to compare cerebral palsy and epilepsy with epilepsy without patients who have cerebral palsy. And what do we found? We find that epilepsy in patients of cerebral palsy starts much earlier. In this study, it was found that 56% of all patients with cerebral palsy had epilepsy before the first year, as compared to only 12% of patients without cerebral palsy. And within the first six years, another 32% of cerebral palsy patients with epilepsy developed epilepsy, compared to a higher incidence in children without cerebral palsy, and very, very few children with epilepsy and cerebral palsy presented after six years, whereas in the non-cerebral palsy population, the presentation was about 50%. So all epilepsy in cerebral palsy presents much earlier in incidence. And what about the types? We can see that the generalized tonic-clonic epilepsy in patients with cerebral palsy is the major presentation. Here, as you can see, 38% as compared to 30% in other groups. And this is followed by the other types of epilepsy types that you can see. And like, for example, absence epilepsy is hardly seen in cerebral palsy. Whereas in epilepsy without cerebral palsy, you do have a good percent, percentage of absence epilepsy. What about the outcomes? As you can see, children with cerebral palsy and epilepsy have a much poorer outcome compared to children who have epilepsy without cerebral palsy. So in this study, they found that all the children without cerebral palsy had a good outcome in 76% patients. And compared to that, only 24% patients had a good outcome in cerebral palsy. And 62% of the patients with cerebral palsy had a poor outcome as regards their epilepsy. The same thing again showed once more that intractable epilepsy, this means that epilepsy that is not responding to treatment, medical treatment or other types of therapy. Intractable epilepsy was seen in 62% of children who had cerebral palsy and epilepsy compared to only 24% children of children without cerebral palsy. It was controlled in 76% of children without epilepsy and only in 38% of children who had cerebral palsy. And more patients with cerebral palsy had to be put on polytherapy, meaning several medications altogether, compared to what we see in epilepsy without cerebral palsy. So this is all statistical data trying to show that how difficult epilepsy can be in children who have cerebral palsy. So the way to treat, the way to investigate is no different, so I'm not going 
in details about how to diagnose. Of course, if you have a child with epilepsy with or without cerebral palsy, you will go through the process of trying to find out the diagnosis by doing certain uh, neurophysiological tests like the EEG, certain neuroimaging like the MRI and the CT scan in the early stages, and also blood tests if you need to do so. There are certain conclusions that I would like to tell you about from these papers that the incidence of epilepsy was higher in cerebral palsies, particularly the tetraplegic type of cerebral palsy, that intellectual impairment, history of neonatal seizures, earlier age of onset, status epilepticus, abnormal brain imaging findings, and need for polytherapy were all associated factors in cerebral palsy in a higher incidence. And epilepsy in cerebral palsy was associated with an earlier age of seizure onset than that in the control group. Other conclusions was generalized seizures were the predominant form of seizures in children with CP, and all infantile spasms were observed among tetraplegic patients. The better seizure outcome was associated with normal intelligence, single seizure types, monotherapy, and spastic diplegia. So within the groups of cerebral palsy, if you do have spastic diplegia, your chances of having a better type of epilepsy is higher. And fewer children with cerebral palsy were actually able to discontinue their anti-epileptic medications. And none of children with infantile spasms or polymorphic seizures achieved a seizure-free period of more than one year. So of course, all these children do have a lot of refractory epilepsy. But the data, like Dr. Jointorai was saying, is not enough. We need to further undergo studies, undertake studies, to find out the risks of epilepsy development and its relation with the EEG and brain imaging. There's a vast dearth of information as to why uh, these children are suffering more from their epilepsy. All children should be tried off anti-epileptic medications after at least two years of treatment. Unless you have a very gross reason like a florid cortical malformation or cortical gliosis, uh, cortical uh, lesion that is very likely to have ongoing seizures and you also have uh, epilepsy that is showing that that is your focus. If you have a generalized pattern where you have a normal EEG with minimal cortical or gray matter involvement in the children with cerebral palsy, then after two years of treatment, you should, like in other children without cerebral palsy, try and initiate to reduce the medications from polytherapy to monotherapy or from monotherapy to stopping the medication in a very, very slow process. And early treatment for epilepsy in these patients is recommended. Why? To avoid further brain damage. Any child who is going into status epilepticus is likely not only to die, but also if he is uh, surviving to also develop further brain damage. And that is what we do not want to do, particularly, of course, for every children, but particularly for a child with cerebral palsy, and also to prevent more cognitive dysfunction. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay for your interesting, informative, yet lucid deliberation. Thank you very much. Any question from audience? I just have no. one question. Uh, in that study you mentioned uh, comparing cerebral palsy and other uh, non-cerebral palsy non epileptics. Palsy, yes. I mean, uh, the age range was, say, 0 to 6 years. And how was they seen as neurotypicals? Was any assessment, they could have other problems, neurodevelopmental problems, other than CP. So I was yeah, thinking it, of that. It was taken, actually the study was taken as um, uh, that th these children had other comorbidities. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you as the details, but they were essentially classified as children not having cerebral palsy. Um, and probably from the general population, um, not going into the details of what other comorbidities they had. Thank you.